And I guess I've been watching more baseball lately. Oh, is it because um, uh, playoffs? Well, it's because Dodgers have third? like Dodgers have clinched. They, they've clinched. They're the um, NFC West champs. So I'm oh, not. No, no, um, the NFC is football. They're the NL. West I just say team. NL. I just say. Do you say hide that? Yeah. <laughs> The yes. NL, the, the NL champs. I'm I, sorry, yeah. I, stay I don't know why, because for because at the same time as I'm sitting here thinking about the Dodgers, I'm looking at the um, I'm looking at I'm like LA Rams. See, you know, I can see the Arizona Cardinals. Cardinals like, are the Diamondbacks logo. No Cardinals football. Oh. I can see Cardinals football in like their logo in my brain. Yeah, it's like. Did you know that over five trillion dollars exchanges hands on a daily basis? That's an average of over two hundred and twenty billion dollars an hour. Now, how does this much money move every single day, and why does it move the way it does? Here on Drunkenomics, two bartenders who also happen to be students at the University of Nebraska Graduate School of Business are going to sit down and drink to the global economy and try and translate it into English. So sit back, relax, pour yourself a stiff one, and have a drink with us to the comedy that is the global economy. All right, guys, welcome back to Drunkenomics, the drinking podcast with an economics problem or two or three. Or ten. <laughs> Let's just go all the it way It is there, that man. kind of week. Yes, it is. I, in so uh, many ways. It's been a week, but what I can say is uh, thank you for joining us or rejoining us as the case may be. I am by the power of the VIX. something this week. I don't know, the VIX, it's, everything else. Um, <laughs> it's still the VIX. It's still at 28.55. Or, yeah, I, mean, I, I am your yeah. more gracious host or the most gracious host james goldwater several states yeah. away and in a less gracious form is is uh, aaron wong yes and i am i uh, wish i could be with you in person and to all of you that, that are yeah. drinking along with us wish i could be with you guys in person maybe one day whether we'll you're like yeah drunken alex bar crawl but absolutely whether you're several blocks away or several states away or several countries away welcome and yeah. if you uh if you want to feel more connected and if you want to join us more often check us out on social media so uh in the metaverse facebook instagram twitter as well <laughs> on drunken omical d-r-u-n-k-e-n-o O-M-I-C-A-L. Oh, Maybe yeah. that'll click together. <laughs> D-R-U-N-K-E-N-O-M-I-C-A-L. There we, there go. we go. That was awesome. And then, of uh, course, uh, you can find us there. From, follow us. Tweet at us. We love interacting with you. And from there, we uh, have the um, Discord invite. So you can jump go. into the Discord, ask questions, talk to other econoholics and drinkonomists. Chat yep. with us. If you, if you just happen to jump into a voice channel and one of us happens to be in here, I'm not saying we do it all the time, but I am saying that we've done it before. We'll just pop Multiple in and be like, times, hey, yes, what's going on? Time. Exactly. Yeah, we'll be more um, than happy to have a drink with you. It's like a cameo, but free. Yeah. Um, well, the, the whole channel, <laughs> Discord, is free to all. So if you guys Absolutely. just want in, hop on um, in. If you guys want, just say like, you know, in the general channel, say, hey, I'm hopping into the voice channel at this time on this day. Does anybody want to drink with me? And I'll, you know, yeah, it's distinctly I'm possible available. one of us I'll, might pop in. I'll do it. We've seen, I mean, yeah. we've seen some pretty sweet bar setups from some of you. Um, mm -hmm. uh, some, I mean, those are some <laughs> Todd, posters. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Todd's killing it. Todd's got a great um, setup. But yeah, uh, before we get into it, um, yeah, I guess, no, so um, you know, I kind of want to apologize ahead of time. I might be a little, Aaron and I both both might be a little bit down yeah. and not quite as exuberant as we usually are. And that's because uh, for those of you that haven't seen, I don't know if we put anything up yet, but Flynn, who um, who was the podcast dog, who our uh, mascot, really, yeah, he I was mean, the mascot who wore that, who wore that beautiful drunkenomics um, bandana. bandana and who used to pop in and out of our episodes every now and again when he just wanted attention. Um, unfortunately, <laughs> he did. Uh, he did pass away last week, um, kind very, of, well, very yeah. unexpectedly. And very so we're, um, we're yeah. still working on that personally, mm -hmm. but, um, you know, we just, yeah. you know, yeah, we're still, still, we're still trying to crank it out. Um, you know, still, yeah. we, we didn't want to skip a week, but we, especially, but you do have as, to, yeah. Yeah. Especially a week as event falls last one, but, uh, yeah, but, despite, I mean, despite this, the grieving process you do yeah. need, to, we need to but, continue. Yeah. It did hit us both pretty hard. Uh, especially you, I mean, you're the, yeah. you're the father of the yeah. dog. So yeah, it was, it was not um, a. Not a, not a good day. Yeah, so it was a rough week, kind of like the week for <laughs> the the English yeah, who, who, English bonds. Let's start there. I mean, I guess that was kind of the big thing, oh, you know. Yeah, English like, guilt. The guilt. The G I L. It's funny. You always you you always hear these British comedians talking about English guilt, and I'm like, are you talking economics? Or are you talking like you personal guilt for yeah. everything you've done in other countries? Which one? <laughs> Oh, economics. Okay. Oh, no, okay. you. No, well, you. Just I. Yeah. Huh? <laughs> exactly. So, so last um, week you start. We started to see. Well, first off, the pound is in free fall. Well, yes, the pound. Their their currency has been devaluing very, very swiftly, and so so kind of in response fall, but, to that. Yeah. In response to that, you saw the Bank of England essentially cancel all guilt sales, all bond sales. They they yes. stopped. They just said we're not going to be selling or issuing any more. Was that the, was that the first debt. thing that happened? Because like I mean, I think it was because I remember hearing about that. Like, well, that was one of the first things. But I know at the end of the day, what it came down to was the the Bank of England. They had to decide pretty much between crushing the British pound or crushing. 
pensions. Yeah. And if you crush a pension, like you're crushing a lot of other financial institutions as well. And you don't want to be the cause of that first domino that falls well, down. Well, okay, okay, right? okay. So if, just, so if we want to look at what the, the proximal cause that set this off was, it was right, yeah, the, the, yeah. New, the new Tory government uh, under trust has said, uh, had issued a statement saying that they were going to cut taxes on the wealthy over the course of the next I don't understand months. how that causes the bond markets to sell off though. I, I mean, I, um, I, I guess like in the sense that like you would sell a long-term bond, that makes sense. Well, I think so. So po- it was in the same period as they're talking about how we have to deal with pen- we have to do something about pensions because pensions are yeah uh, uk is also like i say in the environment of inf- in the inflationary environment you see a devaluing of the currency and then you see a government saying actually and we're going to take less money from the wealthy very yeah. specifically well, from the wealthy I, I understand at the, the same time i understand the tax to, cuts were not very responsible but i'm well, also sitting here thinking like okay it's fiscal policy it doesn't take i mean it takes forever for that to actually affect the economy to affect monetary supply it does, th- and and people will automatically press it in now. I th- I think you know. I think you saw the institution. I think you saw institutions look at that decision by a government that's facing inflation and ener- it's taking inflationary problems, energy crisis, food crisis, Brexit. What aren't they dealing with? And they yeah. saw them go. We're giving tax cuts to the wealthy, and they went, "Oh my god, they oh my don't gosh, know what they're is, doing." Not a good they're idea. They're going to have. They're they're seeing these huge runaway rampant costs, like increases, right. and they're now saying they want less tax receipts, less tax income to deal with this what are they thinking and so that i think led to a crisis of confidence in the government's ability the treasury's ability in the bank of england's ability to pay back to make good on its debt and its currency value i think people just went well Well, and that's the reason why so i mean credit swiss credit swiss credit swiss whatever it is however you say their name right they do a lot of swaps they're they're in awful shape but they do they do a lot in swaps like yeah that 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 historically has been where they yeah exactly so uh, default risk went up, which is the reason why Credit Suisse or whatever, you see, like that's the reason why they're facing the issues that they're facing is because they they sold yeah. a bunch of swaps. All of a sudden, the people that saw the headlines, the investors that saw the headlines for Liz Trust is going to cut corporate taxes, cut t- all these different types of taxes, whatever it is. With the weak pound, they were like, okay, default rates for these gilts could possibly go up because the pound is so weak. Mm-hmm. Um, and so then they're sitting here holding the swap going, if you're like, it's like AIG in 2008. Right, exactly. They're sitting here holding the swaps and they're like, they're uh, insuring the defaults, but the default risk is going through the roof. All of a sudden, the swaps that they're, all of a sudden, the swaps that they're sitting on, or I guess on the other side of the swaps. So I guess they're the ones providing the insurance. So swaps start to look likely <laughs> and it's like, our, we're not capitalized for this. Yeah. Um, well, and the default risk only went up to like, it, the thing about swaps is like, if the default risk goes up to like 4%, it's like Armageddon, right? Which like 4% mm-hmm. really like, what I mean is like, if you, if you, if I loan you a hundred bucks and I'm expecting $96 back, that's really not that big of a loss. But the problem is the reason why the default risk of 4% is so bad is because these bonds are so leveraged, you know, mm-hmm. it, it's, that it's, it's, it's so, not that, that $4 is gets much bigger, very, very. Quickly. Yeah. So because it's so leveraged and the collateral of the, the leverage mm-hmm. is the actual underlying asset. Suddenly, well, wait. One brick falls oh. out of the wall, all the other ones start falling out of the wall too, because it's like, okay, well, now you got to sell this bond. Oh, you also own 50,000 more of these bonds? Well, because you had to sell 10,000 of those bonds, these the, the value of the other 40,000 bonds are way lower. started to swirl the drain. So, yeah, exactly. So that's, I mean, I don't know. I didn't. I don't mean to be like talking way over. No, it's, it's essentially, it's it, the easiest way to describe it is it's late game Jenga. Exactly. Well, it's like, I and mean, think about it this way. Like, what would you think would happen if I was holding, I don't know, a million shares of Wells Fargo, right? I was holding that in my account on margin. And all of a sudden I have a margin call. I have to sell, I have to sell 500,000 shares out of my million to cover my margin call, right? And you're sitting there, you also own Wells Fargo and someone out here just sold 500,000 shares at market price. That's going to push the price of Wells Fargo down. I mean, I made up stock, right? Well, yeah, like, you, well, we start to see, we start to see a bunch of people selling into a market yeah. and that's where, and that's where maybe I'm sitting here and I'm, and I, maybe I went on margin at a much lower price. Yeah. So I, I don't know what Wells Fargo is trading at right now. Yeah, I've, um, yeah. But I, mean, I just, for sake of example, I just, you know, you own a company let's that's say, pretty big. Let's say right? I bought at 80, you bought at a hundred. We both bought on margin. We both bought the same quantity yeah. of sh- the same number of shares i don't know yeah just to, and then i like had these, to sell my 500,000 shares at you know 75 bucks because you know that's that's my maintenance requirement or as you and, and, at well, and not all at 75 but as you trickle down towards 75 what happens is i'm sitting here going wait a minute everyone else is selling before i'm selling 
now I have, I'm compelled yeah. now well, to- Well, but like my 500,000 shares that I sold at market price, that's going to push the price of the stock down, which could put you in a position where you have to do a margin sell out too. To do this, I have to sell the same so, to, to meet my margin yeah, call. Yeah, when you do that, it, it could provoke somebody else to do that. And, and that's the reason why, I mean, that's really what happened. I mean, there was, I forget how many brokerage accounts out there that, that got issued a margin call. It's musical chairs, right? the music yeah. stops and everyone dives for a seat, right? Mm -hmm. that's, that's, that's essentially what yeah. it is. That's essentially what it is. And that's essentially what's happening with the Bank of England. The problem with the Bank of England is that bonds don't necessarily have the same liquidity as stocks. No, and they so, can, but they generally do not. Yeah, exactly. So because of that, their bond prices are getting crushed because of the, the let's just call it pretty irresponsible fiscal policy on Liz Truss. By, Liz Truss and the, and the Tory party. Yeah. There. They've, they've, so that that provoked a very you know I would say reasonable reaction. Uh, a, la a lack of so? a lack of confidence in. Yeah, I mean, I'll say this: this is a lack of confidence in the political leadership, and that's all it is. And yeah. it's them going, okay, they clearly somehow are still somehow they're still in power, and then is what people are thinking. At least financial institutions are thinking somehow they're still in power. Amazing default, and risk. they still haven't yeah. learned anything. Yeah, so default risk shoots up. Everybody decides that they want to dump their bonds in the market. A lot of these pensions hold these bonds on margin. Absolutely. So if that's happening and these bonds are getting dumped, these pensions are getting crushed. It's leading to margin sellouts. And so you and, start to see a compelled liquidation within your pension funds. Yeah. But the Bank of England, they're like, this is terrible for us. This is just a bad look politically. So we're going to play the political game of mm -hmm. chess and we're going to make this move where we buy back however many billion dollars worth of yeah, bonds. Yeah. So what they did is they, so, they stopped the sale of bonds, right? So they're no longer issuing any new bonds. They are. They're going. Okay. There is now a finite supply of bonds of gilts. So, so a Bank of England it? Treasury bond is called a gilt. A gilt. Yeah. Um, yeah. In Germany, G I L T. In Germany, yeah. it's called a boond. Right. So in the U.S., we just call it a Treasury bill or T bill. Um, mm. So every every country has a different name for them. Yep. But uh, yeah. So in in the U.K., they said we're no longer going to sell any gilts. So there's a finite supply of gilts out in the world because yep. they control where they're issued. They control the issuance. Yeah, exactly. And then so, they started buying them back. They said, well, we're going to start buying them. Yeah, supply and demand, they stopped increasing supply, which is weird because like in the US, there's a bond auction like every month, right? So supply is always there. And then of course, ex the bonds mature. So there's, a, when they there's, mature, there's a schedule. We know exactly how many are outstanding. We know how many, you yep. know, what they're worth. We know when they, when they mature, when they mature. When the coupon is. And, yeah. Like, and so suddenly yeah, there's no that. new supply coming. So someone's turned off the tap of new bonds and mm -hmm. they've said, we're going to actually, as the bank, we're going to start pulling these out of the market as well. So yeah. it's, uh, it's, so it, it's a lot of things, right? They, they completely discontinued the issuance of new bonds. So no more new supply. Mm -hmm. They're still maturing. They're still coming up to their term or their par value, whatever it is. And then on top of that, the Bank of England just did like a big suction of supply by buying back however many billion dollars worth of gilts just right. to make sure, literally yeah. just to make sure pensions don't get crushed. Absolutely. So, in, an attempt to, in an attempt to stabilize these funds. Yeah. And, and, and the worst, the real, like really the worst part is a lot of these, it's poor press conferences by her. And yeah. then these are really self-inflicted wounds, kind of like Boris Johnson. Um, <laughs> a self -inflict, it's a self-inflicted wound. But they've, they've now said, actually, never mind. We're not going to, you know what? You're right. A tax cut for the wealthy was a bad idea. Yeah. And so they've decided they're going to they're going to walk that. Back. I mean, honestly, I, th I think this is just kind of what happens. I mean, it, like, it's so weird that like we have all these central banks and we have all the these governments that control money supply and control inflation and the buying power of your own currency. And excuse me for saying this, but I think I think it's really weird that they're in control of this and they have no idea what they're doing. Because the Bank of England has been extremely slow. You thought the Fed was slow here in the U.S. and the Fed has lost credibility here in the U.S. Well, look over at the Bank of England. Like, I'm mm -hmm. sitting here watching them going like, dude, what do you like? I don't even like my own central bank. And you guys are doing an even, even bigger disservice to your own people than yeah, our guys are. So, all right. You're like, right. I got They're still, <laughs> you know, let's assume that the technocrats in the Bank of England who know what they're doing are also sitting here going, but they and don't, we yeah. still have to deal with politicians who are doing Brexit. How are they doing Brexit? When you find out, please tell us because we don't know either. Yeah. Well, because I remember our remember our good bloke, Max. Yeah. So I, uh, love that dude. Uh, but yeah. I follow him on Twitter and he was like, I finally found a place where I can get a pint for less than 10, 10 pounds. Or, I'll, be, I'll be honest. 10 pounds seems expensive for a pint. It does. But, or No, wait. I forget what it was. I, I forget his tweet exactly. But I just remember seeing that tweet. And I'm like, dang, dude. All I right. thought I had a bad here with inflation. But over yeah, there. Yeah, like, well, hmm, that's, yeah. that's not untrue. Yeah, um, but I mean, speaking of collapsing currencies, and Godspeed to you, Max, man. Dude, yeah, yeah, I, I really want to. I really want to meet that guy in person. I, you know, I'm such a huge fan of his. One of these um, days on the tour. Yeah, seriously. 
I don't know what it is about Europeans. Say what you will about Europeans and the English folks, you know, and the Scottish and Irish people. They know how to drink way better than Americans. They seem like they, they I, seem like they're like, they're they have more fun while they're doing it. Yeah, I mean, it's not like, like I mean the old rednecks that live in Nebraska that I you know I, that I befriended when I was there. <laughs> they have a great time too. Don't get me wrong, but like the bars in England are just way cooler. I just think they're like European style bars. The pubs are just. I've, way I've always cooler. preferred a pub to um to the club. Yeah, I've always because uh, everyone's oh, like, oh, yeah, we'll go to the sure. it's disco or a club. I'm like, nah, no, nah, no, nah. no. Like, I, I prefer, I prefer one of those like old English or European style pubs. I just want to sit Even here. Like, I want to sit. I'm gonna drink. I'm gonna drink a pint. Yeah, drink well, some beer. Yeah, well, when I was in relax. Boston not too long ago on on Company Card, like hey. they had European style pubs there, and that was so cool. But whatever. I mean, I di- well, I digress. You know, I'm trying to talk about collapsing currencies here. And I'm trying to transition over to the yuan. Yeah, well, and- so, I mean, I guess if we want to think about it, the yuan has had its worst year since, I think, 1994. Oh 1990, yeah, 1994. I think we kind of lost count it, yeah, at that point. But it's, it's been nearly 30 years since the yuan has, had it, had selling, has lost value like this, and it's down. It's down very yeah. substantially. It's it's. Yeah, I mean, they, obviously, well, China has some very serious problems. But, at at um, one point, it was 7.4 yuan, or maybe even more than that. I don't remember, but it was like 7.4 to one American dollar, which is just... You know, normally it's like around four, right? It's like one, it's, you know, one yuan is about a quarter, but now it's about it's one, like a, it's, it's one like yuan is like cents or 15, something. It's very, yeah, exactly. 13 to 15 cents, which yeah, is it's, it's ridiculous. Roughly it's 14 cents, but yeah. Yeah. yeah so, no, the, well, so the bank, uh, well, Bank of China, so the China State Owned Bank has, it's going to start selling. So obviously we have two reasons this is happening. One, the yuan is losing value because uh, the Chinese economy is it's not, just, it's not doing as well as, as it historically has been. And two, everyone, else, no one else is either. So the other countries are also fleeing to the dollar, which means the dollar is strengthening. This is paradoxically good if you're going somewhere else to buy things somewhere yeah. else, but it's bad if you're trying to sell things into somewhere else, right? We've talked about this for the last few weeks. Yeah. Well, I think, I think part of that is the way the IMF has set things up. Like everybody flees to the dollar because of the IMF, which is not Personally, I don't think it's very good for the global economy, but I digress. Yeah, like it, 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 whether it is or isn't, that is the way it is now. And so <laughs> that's what's happening. But yeah. what so what they're doing, so what the Chinese plan is, is they're going to sell dollars and buy yuan, right? So they're going to sell a strong dollar, a strengthening dollar. They're going to use that money to buy a um, depreciating yuan. And in doing so, they're going to try and arrest the slide in the value of the yuan mm-hmm. at the same time as they try to... Um, slow the increase in the value of the US dollar. So it's a it's right. not a bad plan. It really isn't a bad plan. On behalf um, of China, but I, like so far it hasn't happened correct. yet. It just said like I, or President Prepare Xi, to do it, so. which I don't know yeah. how much they love President Xi anymore. I think he's starting to lose popularity and fast over in China. Well, right, well I don't have boots on the ground I, there, so I don't know for sure. But I think you are probably right. And it's kind of the same way that Putin's losing popularity, which is to say, like, you can be in right. charge as long as you deliver on increased quality of life and increased right. individual wealth. And we really don't care other than that. And when yep. they stop being able to deliver that. Is when you run into the problem. Which they've stopped um, for, I mean, they stopped a long time ago. I mean, we talked about this. The quality of life yeah. in Russia sucks. Life Both expectancy, of them have done yeah, so. Life expectancy in Russia is going down rapidly, relatively speaking. The population is shrinking. That's just, yeah, yeah. It's, yeah, there's a massive alcohol, uh, you know, alcoholism, alcoholism issue, alcoholism, which, yeah. which, you know, ironically speaking, you have, you have, I'm saying that as I'm holding Irish whiskey in my hand. But. Well, you have, you have problems with, in Russia, the problems are there is a lot of drinking, especially in men. And then mm-hmm. obviously to being being a, a Russian man in Ukraine is quite dangerous right now for obvious reasons. <laughs> yeah. Um and then there's also and I don't think they've done anything to battle this, but HIV apparently has become a very serious oh, problem yeah. in Russia and is spreading rapidly. It's not there's they're not doing anything to try and arrest that spread, which yeah. I'll be honest, not a great plan. And then in yeah. China, the uh between droughts, um the economy collapse, droughts, r- poor harvest, markets. economic collapse, COVID. R- just COVID, COVID period, COVID um, period, but zero like, COVID, but yeah, and then, and say, then zero COVID policy, yep, which goes with say it. That, yep. A typhoon hitting a hitting your major, hitting the largest the port ports. in the world. So, Bellicose yeah. behavior towards neighbors that you need technology from. Yeah. Cutting off your nose to spite your face for natural resources for energy in Australia. But they're also starting and, to experience more and more default rates because they buy so much emerging market oh, bonds and and, and consumers <laughs> who who don't trust banks, so they yeah. just stop paying their mortgages. Why yeah, not? Exactly. So uh, so on top of that, so I mean, so. Many Things. Yeah, the good faith and was it the good faith and credit? What's that? What's that full, phrase? The full, that they so the full faith and credit. Yeah, the full faith and credit. Th- that's a big phrase that's used in finance now or, or whatever it is because gold standard's gone. Nothing's pegged to gold anymore. Nothing, nothing's pegged to anything physical. It's all backed by the full faith and credit of some institution, usually of a government. Yeah. Usually, usually a government, right? But. 
that full faith and credit for China completely gone. Like it's it's evaporating very quickly, both internally and externally. So yes. it's, that's that's not a great road to be on. You know, it's bad enough when it's one way, but you don't want it to be both ways. Right. Yeah. So I, look, it's not it's not it's not the worst plan ever. Like I mean, I'll sit here. Like I, you know, there are people who I don't necessarily agree with economically or ideologically. But in the 80s, during some economic issues, especially in 87, one of the big things was that the U.S., because one of the things that the U.S. was doing during global crises was that the U.S. would sell the dollar as it strengthened and it would buy foreign currencies to prop them up. And when you know people might ask like why would you do that? And my response is well we can, we can always print more dollars. That's very very simple yeah. in the United States. But two, well, there's a great line in Margin Call, and I swear this this podcast is going to come back to Margin Call every time because there's always a scene for every it. Every single time. It's because it's just there's there's a it's there's a, a scene movie. for everything. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's um, but there's movie, one yeah. there's this that one part where they're talking in the senior managers meeting, and it's just well what if you had to sell it all? Well you do know our business is buying and selling. When you like, stop doing you, one, the whole model doesn't work anymore. Like it's, it's, yeah. and, and it, so it's that yeah. it, it comes to an end right quick. But yeah, yeah, no. So like, why would you, why would you sell us dollars for in exchange for other currencies? Or, well, yeah. you would like that country to still be able to buy your goods. What are they going to have to buy them with dollars? What do you want from them? Well, maybe you want to buy goods from them. Maybe you just want them to be able to continue to buy your goods. And so you either so, way so you do that. So yeah, either you way, go it's good in for and your... you try to stabilize. It's good for your constituents. It's good for yes. your nation when other people can afford to buy your goods. It's yeah. good for your nation when you can afford to buy other nations' goods. Yeah. Obviously, depending on the cycle of the economy, right? Yeah. Right now, we're in the situation so, where the dollar is super strong compared to everybody else. And and I would so, say it would probably be in the best interests of the United States to, to start, begin a, a gra- not, not you know not drastic but a gradual process of purchasing current selling dollars to buy foreign currencies, well, especially especially if it is with nations that we do do business or intend to do future business yeah. or or have historically well, done. A lot of business. It's yeah. Just- and to your point, this is off of like very limited amount of research. This is like in the last 15 minutes or so that I've researched this. Mm-hmm. The Chinese central bank is sitting on about three and a half, just, I mean, three to four, 3.4 to three and a half trillion dollars in US dollar currency reserves. And the US is sitting on about $35 billion in all nation currency reserves. So obviously, that's a big tilt in the direction of other countries. And I think to your point, this is a really good time for the U.S. to start building those currency reserves because it's one to one with the pound. It's one to seven for the yuan. It's one to one with euro. I mean, it's like the fact that the dollar index is at one thirteen to one fourteen. I forget exactly what it's at. Yeah, it's one thirteen to one fourteen. It's insanely yeah. strong. The fact that it's that much above one hundred. That's it's ten percent above one hundred. We have to really think about the fact that it's that strong. It's a good opportunity for us to do what you're saying that we should do, right? And yeah, I, it, and it really would benefit the global economy if we did that. It would. It, really it, would. would. it would begin a process of. It, 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 now the question that really becomes is how long can the U.S. continue to be that stabilizing influence? The yeah. next one is is you know, and and the answer is indefinitely as long as we can as long as we're printing money, which yeah. we are. But to me, yeah, that would be it would be the that would be the wise choice to very quiet. I wouldn't very I wouldn't publicly announce it. I would just very quietly begin to talk to governments and I'd be like, look, this is what we're gonna do. We're gonna start buying currency from you at this rate. Yeah, we're gonna sell dollars to you and we're gonna buy your currency. And when they go, why? And it's just look, yeah. we've got to do something to arrest the to, to get the dollar index really just, lower, yeah. more affordable. Yeah, I mean, really just to stabilize global trade. Because Absolutely, yeah. everybody does business with the U.S. I mean, how could you not? And not only does so, business with the U.S., does business with each, in many cases, we'll do business with each other in U.S. currency yeah. because it is more stable. Yeah. It's so and The fact of the matter is, like, we're buying euros, we're buying pounds, we're buying yuan, we're buying Japanese yen, whatever currency it is. We're buying those with the currency that is deflating, or excuse me, not, not deflating, but inflating at 8%. Yeah. You know, and speaking of inflation, you know, this is kind of the transition over to that. Let's just start by tackling the inflation story by saying uh, markets are up this week and by a lot. Which is because we had, um, I, I think it's for two reasons. Yeah, can you but, please tell me why? I, 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 I'm, well, I would love to hear your reason. So, I so have my reason, but I love, I'd love to hear yours. Well, okay. So one, there's um, we had a, a pretty fun jobs report, didn't we? Yep. That's my reason number um, one. What was the jolts though? Because it it's I, down. The job down openings by, is down by 1. 1. 1 1, 1. 1 million, but I think the expectation was 1.3. I forget. I didn't look that closely. Yeah. The expectation so, was... So here's 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 what that means. I don't think it's because they added... Let me... What was it? 200 and... 
two hundred eight thousand jobs, which is better than the two hundred thousand they expected. That has yeah. nothing to do with it. Now, the yeah. number of jobs added, the number of openings listed, yeah. and the only reason that is that, that had a positive result in financial markets is because financial markets are going. Oh, thank oh, God. Yeah, we priced in the 1.3. There's an end and, to the increasing expense of employees in sight. So I remember talking with, the, there's a CFA in my office. And I, and I hate to have to say it like that, but it's, oh, good. <laughs> it really is this kind of pessimistic view of, good, labor's about to be cheap again. Yeah. I mean, but this is, we're living in an environment where good news is bad news for the markets and bad news is great news for the markets. And this is, yes. this is so stupid. This is so stupid. I can't labor this point enough. This is so stupid. I was talking to one of my buddies that I work with. He's a CFA. He's a strategist. He's an economist. He's all, he, I mean, he's insanely smart, but like him and I were, were bantering the other day and we saw the jolt support and I was like, did you see the jolt support? And he was like, yeah. And I was like, why are markets up 3%, two and a half, three percent 3%. And he was like, it's so stupid. It's so stupid because Literally, the jobs report gave the markets an excuse to say, okay, the Fed can't hike rates. They can't be this hawkish. They need to be a little bit more dovish because they have crushed jobs that much, which I'm like, that's nope. a stupid reason why to, that's a, such a stupid reason to buy stocks. That it's, is putting the cart before the horse, my friend. And I think <laughs> they will pay for it at the next Fed meeting. I agree. I just, because have you not paid attention to what the Fed has said? The Fed has I said, have. I, they have, I have too. Like, and I'm not, this is not financial advice. I'm not telling everybody to buy puts. I'm not telling everybody to short anything. I'm just saying, no. I don't understand why people are buying this. I'm glad that there are irrational markets because that's, you know, opportunity to make money. Yeah. But to me, I'm just like, dude, job numbers going down is not good. That means a contraction in global economic production. Which is not well, good for the economy. Yeah. It means, here's okay, the thing. So, sorry, let me talk about this in finance and stocks terms, okay? It means shrinking PE ratios. It means shrinking earnings per shares. It means there we go. shrinking top lines, shrinking bottom lines. Whatever you want, whatever fundamental thing you look for in a, in a stock that you want to buy. You're going to start seeing all those the are, bad ones. Yes, it yeah. means all those things are contracting. Oh, yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah. And, and you're right. But the reason they went up is because if you've ever looked, if you've ever looked at when, when things, when <laughs> stock pops after a major jobs report, it almost always is bad news for labor and the stocks shoot up. And it's because you have this, it's because but, a company will sit here and go, ah, I can pay my employees less, and get the same amount of work. Okay, but I swear that really I, is what it is. It's I agree, something happened I, I agree. in the eighties when well, they stopped when when a major American businesses stopped viewing employees as assets and started viewing them as expenses. Okay, and I, I agree. I agree in the sense that like okay, so because the job market is tightening, job posters, people that are hiring, they don't have to pay their employees as much because it's like they okay, don't think they have. They don't to. think they have to. Fair enough. Which really that's what matters, unfortunately. Well, uh, Unfortunately, yes, I'm, 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 yes and I no, but it. yeah, as a whole, yes, no, you're not. I don't incorrect. love that. That's the case, but it's like, okay, well, we don't have to pay twenty five bucks an hour because there aren't as many of you I guys. Don't, I don't have you to know, offer like, twenty five an hour anymore. There's, yeah, there's, I don't, I don't, there's ten of you, and I have five jobs available. I'm offering yeah, twenty. I mean, exactly. Like when there are one, when there's one person, you have two job openings, and you're willing to pay twenty two dollars an hour. I got to be willing to pay twenty three dollars or more. But in this case, now yeah. it's like, okay, now it's starting to even out. Yeah, just a little bit. I, they, 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 from a certain perspective, I can say I understand seeing like a stabilization in wages. As well, it's really, a, I mean, a stabilization but, in wages but, but me, will, it, it will crush inflation, yes. you know, at least in the near term. But, but also as an investor, I would sit here and say like, seeing a stabilization in wages might make me more willing to go into certain lines, certain kinds of business. It's like, okay. Yeah, I mean, strong balance sheets, high dividend. It's going to start to make more, like, I'm not just going to see running, like, ever increasing things happening in between the top and bottom lines, right? Like, it's not going to be this very, it becomes less expensive to produce whatever we were producing. Yeah, but I really don't think, like, I I really don't think the market shut up because of the cost of labor is going down. Like, I don't- Uh, Not going down, but the the, the potentially- stabilizing. The potentially it's stabilizing. Yeah, but I don't- I think think that's what it was. Yeah, but I- But I'm ghoulish. I know, I know you are. And that's what I love about you, among other things. But like, you know, like it's, it's one of those things where I, I don't necessarily feel like that was it. I feel, like, I feel like the main driver of the reason why everybody bought back into the markets and even the bond markets, see the bond markets shot up on, you know, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday of this week. But yeah. I think the reason why it happened, I, I know it doesn't make sense, but it, it they're igno- I, th- I think know? they're so ignoring a very... I no, I think what they're only looking at is the Federal Reserve. That's what I think. I, and, I th- and I think they're ignoring that the hawks in there 
aren't necessarily concerned. They don't I've made care. very clear for the last few months that they are more concerned with inflation than they are concerned with markets. Yeah. And, um, and they and, don't and, care. And to, be, like, and to be fair, like, uh, from an extent, markets will fix and recover and take care of themselves. They will. Yeah. Inflation won't. Yeah. But this is the thing is like when I say they don't care, it's like the markets don't care that there are hawks in the Fed and the hawks, they also don't care that the markets that, exist. Well, they do. I mean, they do care by the market. Or that markets would hurt. They do care. They don't care that markets might hurt. Yeah. So that's what I'm saying is like they don't care that people are buying into this narrative that because the labor market is looking the way it is. They're mm-hmm. like, well, we don't care because we're still going to proceed with our hawkishness. Yeah. We're not going to give you any rate reduction projections until until we see inflation peak and stabilize and all and, and decrease. And, yeah. and and I know I said this last week, two weeks ago. I honestly believe the Fed. I think they may they may. I don't think they've said it publicly. I haven't seen them say it. I've seen a few. They have suggest that this is what they are need. talking about. The are I, talking about the, the real interest rate, a positive real interest rate. And I think in their meetings, they're sitting there and they're going. I, I don't think, I think they legitimately think they have to see that or see something no, very close to I, it. I don't think. And maybe this is where my opinion differs from you a little bit. But I don't think they want a positive real interest rate. I think what they want is a zero real yeah, interest rate. I think that's what they want in the long term. But I think yeah. in the short term for medicine. They're going to have to get to oh, positive okay. yeah. and then come off it. Yeah, I mean, I, I think like ideally if the Fed could actually control everything really well and if they were actually smarter than they said they were, it's going to, I feel like if they could control everything, they would have the real interest rate at zero all the time. Yeah. All the time. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that, that would be the best. I mean, honestly, like, like that would be, be efficient. You know, <laughs> if they could control everything at a zero real interest rate, I would actually find solace in the fact that there is a Federal Reserve that does control money supply and employment. Yeah, but, well, it's it's too many too many levers, not enough hands, and the levers yeah. don't all do the yeah. right thing. But I really um, think markets shut up earlier this week because investors were looking at the job market and they thought, okay, because the job market is is tightening faster than expected, mm-hmm. the Fed might become a little bit more dovish sooner than we expect. So because of that, we're going to buy back into the market. Do, okay. Do I think it's mature? No. Okay. Sooner. Okay. Well, the, well, the, well the, is it possible that now the Fed will become more dovish sooner than we expected? Yes. We may see it sometime in 2024. I don't know why that helps you buying this week. <laughs> <laughs> that's, I, that's, that's how I, I'll, I'll respond I, I to don't, that. I don't I mean, think 20, I mean, 2024 is very optimistic. Or, or, I mean, it's, it's late. Who knows? Well, I mean, nowadays, the Fed is just, you know, they're just data dependent. So like if the data suggests that in 2023, inflation is at 2%, and I'm not saying this is going to happen, but I'm saying if, if in 2023, inflation is at 2% and interest is at Five and a half percent. Yeah, they I'm sure they would come down. Cut, I'm, right, so, I'm sure that, I mean, yeah. bar, barring anything else, they'd probably come down a little bit. Just, they'd probably come down to about two to two and a half. Right. I mean, I don't think, like, yeah, I mean, I don't think, I don't think interest rates are going to ever get to five and a half percent. Personally, I don't. But, I think they might. Yeah. But for, for <laughs> sake of me. example, I mean, that's why I brought up the five and a half percent. But I mean, yeah. But yeah. I mean, I mean and, and, you're, and you may be, and you may be right because like, because we're seeing a lot of other indicators that show that industrial and economic demand is, is dropping globally. Well, and the thing is, like inflation, you know, we talked about the real interest rate. And it's it's the actual Fed funds rate minus inflation. Yeah. Inflation is nowadays really driven by food and energy. Well, speaking of food and energy, what's been happening on the energy front? Well, depends on where you are. If you're on Earth, what I could say <laughs> is oil is about to become more expensive because OPEC on Plus Earth. has decided that they are going to cut production by 2 million barrels a day, um, which yeah, is what's twice it? what the expected amount was. Do you know but why they did Saudi that? Saudi Arabia. I, I think Saudi Arabia is dealing with, um, I know why Russia wants that. Right. They're broke and too. desperately yeah. need money. I know why a lot of the other countries want that. They're also dealing with very severe economic challenges. I know why, <laughs> Sa- I think Saudi Arabia to an extent wants it because they're seeing like, well, there's no point in getting into, a, into an oil war, into a price war. When when the global economy isn't in a when no one's really in a position to absorb, consume, and right where there's where there's no end in sight to the war, like six months to hurt someone, but that's it. Maybe, yeah, definitely no. Um, yeah, so that's probably why you're seeing Saudi Arabia. But I'm just like, I, dude. Um, I, I mean, and I've vocalized my disdain for OPEC. I don't times. like cartels for business reasons. I, for economic reasons, I dislike cartels. Even if it wasn't a cartel, and I don't know how it would not be labeled as a cartel, but even if it wasn't a cartel, I would I would still hate OPEC. Oh, I mean, my thing is like, yeah, I I I don't care for OPEC because it 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 does it has cartel behavior. Yeah, I don't care for any cartel. I don't I don't love the U.S. airlines because 
let's yeah, be honest, they're, they're a cartel. cartel. Yeah, exactly. They're not behaving rationally in an economic market. Or they are, but it's but it's not for the benefit of everyone in the market. Yeah, it's right? only for the benefit of them and their friends. That's it. Them. Nobody yeah. else. So um, OPEC, so you know, there may like, also, and I'll be honest, on top of that, there is also a decreasing industrial demand for oil in China. And that means that there's decreasing industrial demand for oil really kind of everywhere. Yeah, but to me, um, like, okay, so... So far this year, oil got up to 120, and not just like mm-hmm. not not American oil, global oil, right? So the ICE, those got mm-hmm. way above 120 at one point, and they're sitting on a couple of months of just huge profits because their break even is still around like 55 dollars yeah, a barrel. Generally, 50 to 55 is kind of in the U.S. what we right. say. Right. So like, I mean, their their profit margins were like just absurd, especially for a commodity that is very inelastic that everybody needs to buy. And still, after months and months of crazy profits, they decided to just cut oil production by 2 million barrels a day, which really does affect the global markets. Because if oil is cheap in Europe, it's cheap everywhere. Yeah, it's well, cheaper I mean, so, everywhere. I mean, to go on to, because it's not just oil, there's other, there's other energy issues to consider. So if we yeah. move past oil, we know that this doesn't help China. It really doesn't because China's hydroelectric dams are having problems because there's right. drought. There's no water to power them. Um, even if, you know, so any oil fired plants or any natural gas plants, they're they're they've sourced new suppliers, but are they necessarily going to be able to move enough supply to fire these plants? That remains to be seen this year. Um, if yeah. you're in Italy, energy probably got a little bit less expensive because your natural gas flowing through Austria from Russia is back on. It's now back Shipments yeah, are coming through so, again. If you're in but, Germany, uh, the Nord Stream pipeline one and two both underwent. Both well, two oh, stopped. No, not just stopped. One and two both stopped, and then. After mysterious explosions we started are now leaking, leaking yeah, gas started leaking. Yeah. into the into the water and are filling with 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 ocean water, which means that those pipelines are now done. They yeah. are they are now useless pipelines. I won't say how these explosions happened because I don't know. I don't know either. But yeah. I do know that the explosions happened on the pipelines very close to a pipeline that runs from Norway to Poland, which is was meant yeah. poles built to cut their reliance on Russian natural gas right. and that if this wasn't an accident and I'll be honest I'm not sure how an explosion is an accident what I'll well, say is it, I mean, it would take it, a relatively complicated state actor correct. to there you go, do yeah. these and I can only think of one that has anything that could possibly be trying to send some sort of message with this yeah, so well I, I also remember they end in Germany a nation which recently handed control of several Russian owned refineries over to um, state regulators so I wonder if there's anyone who might be a little upset about that and obviously right. would then yeah. maybe do something to try and send a message now. Um, exactly. Look, is it possible? Is it possible that this is just an accident in Russian incompetence? Absolutely. I mean, I, I, all I'm going to say is this, their, their Black Sea flagship didn't get hit by Ukrainian missiles. Yeah. It, it caught fire and exploded because of incompetence. Remember, that's what they said. Yeah. Their <laughs> airbase in the Crimea was not bombed by Ukrainians. It was it their is, own soldiers yeah, smoking near an ammo locker, right? Just incompetence. So, totally, like, totally. It's worse. Yeah. It's worse when it's incompetence, but whatever you want to do. So but, look, this yeah. was just a terrible accident. Whoever was running the pipeline from the Russian side of things, I don't know. I guess he, he accidentally put explosives in the pipeline instead of natural gas and just thought it'll be fine. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so for some <laughs> reason, that, <laughs> that's all I got. That's all I got. That, I, I don't that, know. Yeah, that kind of incompetence led to that. But for some reason, Russia decided to resume the flow of oil to uh, Italy through through Austria. uh, Austria? So a pipeline through Austria. Um, I wonder. I wonder if this is any. I I have a sneaking suspicion this might be as a way to curry favor with the new government we discussed last week. Yeah, Yeah. I know. So like, I'm I'm kind of curious. I'm curious about that. But I feel like maybe look when you you know when when you're Russia's Russia also has some other serious problems. The big one is I mean is they say they've shut off the flow of they've they've stopped selling gas to Europe because we'll sell we'll sell that gas everywhere else and we'll make our and we'll make the same amount of money in the response. And the problem with that is no, you won't because one, you kids can't move that much gas. Well, it's, I mean, not, it's, but, not, it's not. It's not just like snapping your fingers. Right. And two, even if it was, the places you're selling it to can't afford to make up the loss in income. Yeah, but the thing about the whole Italian thing is like Maloney has been. Who Maloney is the new prime minister of Italy. Mm-hmm. She's been very vocal against Russia. She's been very against the whole Russian thing. So like the fact that yeah, Russia would yes. do this 
to gain favor in Italy. I don't know if that's, uh, you know, I, I don't know if that's the case, but maybe, maybe, maybe I mean, it that's, is. Uh, the only thing is, is you're trying to buy goodwill from the Italians. Right. You're trying to get the Italians to, if, if not be on your side, to not be against Well, but, but the you thing is, nobody, nobody knows what actually, what's actually going on under the table, right? Because press conferences, True. they'll say one thing. Um, and I'm not accusing Maloney of that because I hope to God that she is actually as anti-Russia as she is, as she says she is. Uh, but the thing is, like OPEC, I feel like their decision to reduce oil production by 2 million barrels a day is incredibly irresponsible. And the White House, whom I've well, disagreed with multiple have, times. have said they're not going to release any more from the strategic reserve. No, they um, said they're going to release. Oh, that's. I saw they're going to release like 10 million or 5 million barrels. From, I saw that he wasn't planning to. I guess yeah, they said it's million, possible. 10 million. That's what I saw. So. Um, I saw that he was going to release 10, 10 million more barrels, I should say, of the Strategic Petroleum Reserve. Which okay, I'm like, yep. He said he w- he said he will release they will release ten million barrels next month. Okay, um, so in that case, like why even, offset. in that case, why even have a Strategic Petroleum Reserve? I I mean, whatever. <laughs> and all that to combat OPEC. This is why I hate OPEC. Like we can be a hard on Biden for this, and we should be, uh, because the the release of ten million. Barrels from the SPR. Well, let's look at this makes way. no sense. Uh, I'm pretty sure that two million a day adds up to sixty million barrels. Yeah, it'll 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 offset by seventeen percent, sixteen percent, whatever one over six is. Yeah. So what? It, yes. Uh, seven, is that yeah. Sixteen. A bit 17. More, sixteen and a half. Or closer to seventeen percent. Yeah. Something like that. Yeah. So um, so for me, and this is and this is where I put on my tinfoil conspiracy hat. And, yes. Um, thank God, because I did that last week. You ready? So, okay. Sorry. Now, this, is, this yes. isn't actually so much tinfoil conspiracy as it is a series of possible but very unlikely events. Okay. I'm all ears. Iran is having some political problems. They are. So basically what happened is a young woman um, was, was, taken, was, was arrested by the morality police in Iran because yeah. it is a thing. And she died in their custody. And, um, yeah. now, and then there were riots uh, and protests all over Iran. It, I think 16 different cities, in, yeah. or 18 cities and 16 provinces. Is it a mainly and, um, it's, a, it's a human rights thing, right? Like it it is. But if you look at who's protesting, yeah. it is young. It is the young. Good, yeah. the young people are protesting. And so at, the, at one of Tehran's big universities, one of the major ones, which is where the best of their Iran's uh, youth go, there were protests there and then crackdowns, huge crackdowns. And so it's very clear that there's that the young are very unhappy. So if you look at who's being shot in these protests, it is 16, 17, 18 year olds. So there is a political instability in Iran now. I don't know if it ends in a revolt, but it might. So right. tinfoil moment. OK, I really like where this is going. Actually, I actually All right. Do. Saudi Arabia yeah. is sitting here going is potentially sitting here and thinking if Iran overthrows its government, enacts a new democratic regime like they had pre Shah, granted yeah. that like not the U.S.'s best moment, but um, <laughs> If they end up with a democratic government that is interested in the well-being of its people and that is able to and does re-enter the global oil supply trade, that really throws off Russia's power, Saudi Arabia's power, oh. by reintroducing a huge player with proven oil reserves and with the ability to extract it. So it's there is a oh. I wonder if there is a possibility that some of these that OPEC the players why. are looking at Iran and going, we think that they might be about oh. to re-enter the re-enter the game. That's actually a really good point. I never thought about that. And I'm and, so and, glad and, you brought it up. Like that's And the next thing is yeah. and when I say like is my tinfoil hat, my tinfoil hat would say, Oh, and it could be next year. More likely yeah, this I will mean, lead to some sort of liberalizing reform. Because even Khamenei, so the Ayatollah in Iran has said well, not all women have to wear the hijab because well, some of our strongest supporters don't. And so it, there's this very interesting new liberalization you're seeing. And, and there may be this this true yeah. legitimate handing of, of liberality to the people of Iran. And I think now I think the problem is, is if they do it, if they do that, it happens one of two ways. Yeah. They do this because the people there are going, or the young people are going, we don't believe this. This doesn't. OK, so you're not, this doesn't play to this camera. That dog doesn't. That yeah, dog yeah, don't yeah. hunt. Like humor me for um, a second. OK, so. Sure. OK, so this revolt, like what will this actually do for the oil production in Iran or OPEC or whatever it is? Like what will that actually do? Because I feel like there is a connection in the sense that there is going to be a, some sort of political takeover. Or some sort of political regime, okay. you want to call it that. So, that so, the young so here's the right gonna... thing. So right now, as of 2022, there, is an, there are trade embargoes on the amount of oil you can buy that comes from Iran. 
They produce. So, so what so, I'm saying is, suddenly you have this player. If those sanctions, if those, if those embargoes go away, uh-huh. then suddenly there's a bigger pool of oil to buy. That's that you can buy. So that's fascinating. Yeah. Right. So, so okay. that's I didn't know that. I actually, I, I'm so glad you brought that up because I really had no idea. Iran has so a, all of a sudden. Iran, Iran has essentially 10 percent of the globe's proven oil reserves. Oh. What what I'm saying is is that you might take short-term gain at the expense of everyone else if you see the four, if you see the potential that the fourth largest proven oil reserves in the world are about to be allowed back into the market. Right, so long way of me saying like, you know, if these guys want free trade, all of a sudden supply of oil shoots up. Yeah, so you have a new player entering the game. Bam. You have a yeah. new player entering the game and when they enter the game, they will be the fourth largest player. Yeah, so that's huge. Yeah. Okay, so maybe that's why OPEC is yeah. like, hedging in. Just think about that. this: like, so Venezuela has the largest proven oil reserves, about yeah, twenty, about eighteen percent. Yeah, but their market um, goes on tap. Yeah, so. well, but but again, so that's but that's great. But imagine now you've you've allowed a country with half the proven oil reserves of Venezuela is now back in the market and is and is ready to do business. So suddenly, it, you're Saudi Arabia. Yeah. You're like, oh, well, that's an issue. You're Russia. That's an issue. Also, they're closer to other places near me who maybe they want to trade with for less expensively. Yeah, it's just essentially it's you're 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 playing a game of poker and you let someone come in and there you've had someone who you've kicked out of the game but still has money and now you're allowing them back into the game and they have the fourth biggest pile of chips. Yeah, when you let them back into the game. Okay, so that's so you really- might you might start. Big stack bullying some stuff and doing some stuff that isn't great to try and gain well, a stronger position while you can. Well, that's what the U.S. is doing for a long time, but now we've drained most of our petroleum reserve, so we can't really do that anymore, at least on this front. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I mean, that's actually really, I'm glad you brought that up, because I honestly never even thought about that. Well, it was my tin hat um, moment for the month, okay, or the week. Dude, I mean, I have tin hat moments all the time, so I'm glad you've kind of leveled the playing field in that. Yeah, thing. no, that's, I mean, that's, that's where I'm at. That's what I think yeah. that is, but um, but I do I do still think that uh, OPEC's decision was very anti-American, and I feel like I mean if if you're an oil trader, if you're an energy or commodities trader, I think I think you're having a ball. I don't know for sure, but I think it was I think it was a, I think it was a short-sighted, and it wasn't in the U.S. But it wasn't necessarily in the interest of the United States for this to occur. Yeah, I mean Joe Biden I, has I, really come out and said I mean, Joe Biden literally has has been like OPEC has taken an anti-American stance. And I agree with yeah. him. I, I, actually, I actually agree well, with him. It, it, you know? well, we'll, we'll see how this plays out. But at this point in the yeah. night, I actually, I actually have to turn my heater on because yeah. I'm getting a little cold. Oh, um, you're getting cold? Which is wow. a weird thing to have to say. Uh, and is I think the fall? big problem is it is the fall. It's, uh, the temperature has fallen. And my big issue is that I left my hoodie upstairs. And what kind of hoodie is that? That's absolutely my Drunkonomics hoodie. The one <laughs> oh. that I acquired from drunkonomics.myspreadshop.com. Yeah. Where and That's there you can it. find, yes. uh, and and we'll put up, um, if you haven't uh, already looked through, we, we still do have the dog bandanas, so you can, in memoriam for, for our boy, for the our, podcast dog, Flynn, yeah. um, you too can, can have one of those for your dog. Uh, you can have a hoodie like us, you can have yep. uh, a golf polo like Aaron, like, really yeah. anything anything yeah. you want on if that one. If you want to look like a former college golfer, um, all you got to do is just buy a uh, Drunkenomics golf polo. That's just a little bit of swag. I used to wear, yeah. And you know, if you want your dog to look as good as Flynn, the best looking dog ever. Absolutely, I mean, there's there's a way you can definitely dress them. Yeah, dress them in a similar fashion. Best looking dog ever. Um, and if you've yep. got too much merch, if you've got too much, uh, if you've got too much stuff, if that's not if that's not the supply chain issue you're dealing with right now, <laughs> yeah. but if you have it, on, yes, if you have your own know. personal, if you have your own personal liquidity crisis and you want to help us with our with our slightly different liquidity crisis, very slightly different, and you yeah. can check us out at uh, <laughs> at uh, Patreon, p a t r e o dot com yeah, it, um, Patreon, P A T R E O N dot C O M slash D R U N K U N M I C S. Yeah, if you want to leave a tip in the tip jar, I, uh, we would very much appreciate yep, it. Yeah, you can help us keep the uh, our lick our, um, our our liquor flowing, the uh, the, the ice, drinks flowing. That's our liquidity crisis when the drinks stop flowing. The <laughs> ice frozen. That's a different liquidity crisis we have is when the ice is liquid instead of instead of frozen. Yeah, another, then, another um, yeah another liquidity crisis we might have is like the fruit. Yeah, so I mean and the yeah, yeah and keeping our yeah, citrus basket stocked because exactly. obviously we need that. I'm gonna make and my then, hands, um, you know, gonna garnish it, you know. But <laughs> seriously, anything is appreciated. But uh, like the fact that you're drinking with us, I, I appreciate that. But on top of that, yep, you know, we love it. Yeah. But with that said, All right, yeah, so hope, yes. hope, hope you get home safe wherever you're going, and uh, you know, continue to play chestnut checkers. You need to uh, fill and kill. And, Absolutely. Uh, most importantly, um, do that. Uh, what's that, uh, that thing this week? But uh, you got to do that thing where you stay drunkenomical. That's what it is. Cheers, my friend. Cheers. <laughs>